We really enjoyed having y'all here. And in 2011, we ended the event with a panel. So I think it actually was a lot of fun. We had half a dozen of the speakers come up. We just asked some general Q&A. And this is also an opportunity for you all to ask the burning questions that you have. One of the things that is different this year from a 2011 is we're going to give this one a little bit of a theme. And so I sat down and I looked at you know, where we've come, where the web, where current development design has come over the last 14 months. And one of the things that really stood out to me was devices, mobile, tablets, tablets, whatever you call them. That the world of devices and the ubiquity of HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, has really become the big talking point about the open web these days. And so I looked at, and you can see that in our lineup. So I looked at our lineup, and I, I grabbed a few of the, the speakers that were talking about that subject, and I asked them to be here and make themselves available. And so we have some, we have some mics in the back. We are encouraged to ask questions. And as we get started, I would like to ask our speakers to introduce yourself and say what it is you do or what it is about mobile devices, mobile common devices. Really gets you in the okay. Um, hi, I'm Mike Taylor. I work for Opera Software, um, and I do uh, email support. Um, if you guys, if web pages don't work, shoot me an email. Um, what What is it about devices that gets me excited? I guess the the most exciting thing for me as a developer, um, sometimes they let me build things, is uh, with the web platform. If you know a handful of skills, right? There are, are infinite numbers of, of things to learn on the on the web, but if you know a handful of things, um, you can really build uh, and build exciting applications that have a far reach, right? Like you can get onto to mobile, you can get onto native just with web tech. You can you can be anywhere. Um, that's exciting for me. Hi, I'm Joe McCann. I work at Bizarre Voice here in town, uh, mobile and platform architect there. And what I like about devices is uh, not only how we can proliferate content across all of them, but what I think is really exciting is how we're going to have uh, devices start to be self-aware and start to communicate with each other and how that actually plays in. I think we're going to see a lot more of that, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, my name is Estelle Weil. I'm out of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and I am a freelancer. And what I like about mobile devices is uh, mobile browsers and the fact that n almost no one has Windows devices. So, um, I mean, now there's Windows 10, but w the reason I like that is because there's all this new stuff coming out, and when I teach new stuff about CSS3 and HTML5, usually the crowd doesn't know any of it because they're working for a company that has to support Windows machines, and I don't, when I'm doing mobile, I don't have to support Windows machines. So I can really experiment with, I mean, there's so much cool stuff out there, and you can actually play with it, and it'll work. And you don't have to worry about older browsers. My name is Burke, I think. I'm really drowsy. <laughs> Nobody else is drowsy, I do not believe you. You're not even laughing, that's how drowsy you are. <laughs> My name is Burke Holland. I live in Nash, Vegas, which is awesome. Um, and I get excited about mobile because the web experience on mobile is nothing like it is on the desktop in that, you know, just, just the fact of you can touch things and move things around and that's a completely immersive and different experience than the web. And the fact that we can take web technologies and use those on mobile devices um, to, to leverage that sort of user experience to me is just awesome. So I'm Ryan Joy and uh, I work at Microsoft. I do have a Windows device. Um, <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Anybody else? <laughs> they, ha they, ha uh, they have I-10 on them. And, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but what excites me about mobile is, is it isn't so much the actual devices, but more the concept of mobility and uh, uh, like ubiquitous experiences across devices and across um, experiences. So when Mike was talking about the, uh, the Opera t uh, TV stuff today, or if I'm using a tablet device or a phone device where I go back to my laptop, or if I'm using it as, as a second screen in my lap at, while I'm interacting with another device over here, it's that, that merging of the worlds between uh, uh, these siloed 
device experiences and, and uh, again, going ubiquitous with all of that. And you can't really do that without the web tech and HTML5 is the, is the obvious choice for that, that kind of uh, cross-device experience. Awesome. Uh, my name is Christopher Schmidt. I'm an author and uh, conference organizer uh, for Environments for Humans. Um, I guess I'm excited about mobile in that uh, same way I was excited for the web uh, when it first came out for the desktop browser, just to be able to, uh, as a back, my, back design, my background is a designer, and so I was able, when the web came, I was able to design things and have, them, and have that design and that message just cross you know, geographies and cultures and be spread out, and so with mobile, that's even uh, more so. And then also what's really exciting is that uh, there's gonna be people uh, in this world who will never ever have a desktop computer, but they will have a smartphone or mobile device, like an iPad, and they'll never ever have to have a keyboard or anything like that. So, like, so that, that kind of like, that scares the living bejesus out of me, but uh, it's also really cool that we're gonna live in that type of world. Cool. So if anybody has a question, feel free to go up to either of the mics. Go ahead and queue up. I'm gonna start my first question, so if you got one, please step up. Travis, you're right there, man, ask your question. You got it. I'll give you a minute, okay? So my first question is for Joe. So Joe, you did a talk today called What is Future Friendly? And I think that I want to hear, I want to hear your two-minute thesis on that one because I think everybody should hear it. I think it's a great, it was a great talk, and I think, I think it'd be good to tell people what that was about and give us the sort of quick ending for us. So you want me to do a 30-minute talk in two minutes? Yeah, man. Okay, I got it. Well, and I'll say, too, all right. that all of the sessions today were recorded and will be online in a couple of weeks, so this can also just be a teaser to watch Joe's talk in a couple ah, of weeks. Got it. I too. like it. Okay. Um, in the beginning. Okay. Uh, so the concept of my talk of what is future-friendly is future-friendly itself is a, a loosely used buzzword, particularly in the web design community, around making your websites be future-friendly, and that's accomplished uh, through responsive web design for the most part. And what I was actually suggesting is, is that being future friendly with the web is one part of supporting mobile, uh, but being truly future friendly is having a content strategy that will actually target n number of devices that are internet capable. So right now we have things like the desktop web, the mobile web, the tablet web, the phablet web, the TV web, uh, but we also have things like native iPhone applications, Android applications, tablet applications, uh, smart TVs, um, even things like digital signage, where people, um, we typically as web developers and designers wouldn't think to design or develop content that would be served up on a digital sign. Uh, the proliferation of digital signage, for example, is going up dramatically. So you'll see digital signs in places like airports, retail uh, environments, et cetera. So from a content perspective, it's fantastic to focus particularly on web browsers as endpoints, but I th my, my suggestion is, is to not only think of it as the primary and only single endpoint, is that the web is ubiquitous across a number of devices, but your content should be actually be able to live in a number of other places. And I mean, if you think about it, just a few years ago, we didn't even really know what an iPad was. We didn't know what it looked like. We, we kind of thought there was a lot, plenty of rumors on TechCrunch about it, but we didn't know exactly what it was. And now, every one of us is having to design and develop uh, experiences for that. So what devices are they making right now? Uh, whether it's a Kickstarter project or on, on uh, behind the scenes at Apple, what are we gonna have to be developing and designing for just in the next, the next couple of years? And I think if you actually create a content strategy that's supportive of any of these types of internet capable devices, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for success. Awesome. How'd I do? It's great, man, okay. thank you. Jeffrey, you got a question? Hi. If we were to go back to 2007 and look at, you know, iOS sort of changed a whole lot of things and, and the rest of the industry came on board, and then fast forward another five, seven years, we're going to have another paradigm shift, and then another seven years. And so as we're building applications now, in your own perspective, where do you think those next paradigm shifts are? We just, we just got touch. Touch is really coming in a meaningful way. What's next? You want this, this for everybody, right? Anybody? Whoever has an opinion. Cool. Um, okay, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think the, some of the, the, next, the next big thing type area in computing is going to be what I was mentioning earlier, are self-aware devices and, and how devices actually 
talk to each other. So for example, we're all in this room, most of us have smartphones in our pockets, but none of these smartphones know that there are other smartphones in, this po in, in the pockets. So how can devices actually end up communicating with each other in a software fashion, in a, an efficient fashion that doesn't burn your battery down, that sort of thing, right? Um, so that, that's my opinion. I, th I like the, the concept of software devices and how devices will be connecting to each other and what kind of experiences can we create around these types of connected devices, not just connected to, say, some central telecoms satellite. I'll, I'll settle for my phone and my iPad and my Surface and my laptop and my MacBook Pro and my other test device over here not all going off at the same exact time with a meeting reminder when I'm sitting at my, at my desk. And I have to, I have to like yeah. click dismiss on six different devices. Yeah. Or, or remove, or remove my, like that, that service from them, right? That's just, a, it's just one of those things. It's like, come on, guys, we have the technology. We can solve this. Uh, it's, it's really frustrating. Although, I guess, I guess it's a, it's, that's a uh, first world tech problem, because uh, I don't think most people are sitting at their desk with those many devices. Um, but, uh, so one of the, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of still interested in, uh, so right now, with the, with the explosion of apps, we, we still have this very siloed approach with everything. Uh, we're starting to break out of that uh, with, uh, with contracts between apps and, and some, some ways to share data between apps, um, but it's still not quite there. So I'm really interested in, in when the device um, isn't just a, a repository for individual experiences for apps, but you know, each one of those kind of together create this ecosystem that is your device, your phone, uh, working together to, to, pre to present to you the contextual information that you would want uh, when you need it. I don't know how that comes about, but I think there's, there should be like a natural evolution to that. So, you know, like the Google Visor. <laughs> Maybe the Google Visor. Anybody else have one of the, Burke, you want to go on there? Okay. Um, you know, I think that the next big shift's going to actually occur in the enterprise, um, and it's going to be that I think that the enterprise spends a lot of time, you know, living in several years behind where they're running Windows XP or they're running probably Windows 95 still. And, and, but a lot of these, you know, these people have at home, they have iPads and they have you know, these mobile devices that completely obliterate the stuff that they have at work that they spend eight, nine hours a day on. Or probably right, right at eight hours a day, probably not a second longer. Um, <laughs> but I think that the next big shift is going to be that the enterprise is going to embrace mobile devices. and. kind of generic um, PC setup and the tower and the, the whole IT scenario and you're locked down and you can't install this app or that app and I think that whole landscape is going to change um, and we're going to see more mobile devices um, competing at work and then maybe device becomes for work and it becomes personal as well and there's not a separation between the two really. All right. Um. Oh, is it on? Okay. Uh, one of the things, uh, I think it's actually a question I think that you, Estelle, mentioned to Burke, right? Uh, it def like uh, defined Facebook, which was there was lots of tricks and things, you know, with like Translate Z on mobile devices and, uh, you know, Android 2 and Android 4 have, you know, different techniques that you have to apply. Is there, do you guys know of any resources out there uh, that, um, is that kind of combines these ideas with the mobile, or maybe even just beyond the question of, you know, tricks of, of keeping different versions of uh, mobile devices, um, knowing the tricks for different mobile devices, but necessarily a better resource for being able to understand differences between different versions of devices and uh, mobile, and uh, what's going on with that. Um, we were talking earlier about a possible resource of all the quirks in all the browsers, but the main tool that I use before actually implementing anything on a mobile device is I go to Can I Use. It lists everything, almost everything. I mean, there's a lot of features it doesn't list, but most people are probably not hitting those features. I'm reading the spec and writing about them, and no one's implementing them yet, so it's not even on Can I Use. And I'm like, darn, I wish, you know, I wish it was on there so I would know if any browser supports it. 
quickly without having to bother with Google. Google comes after um, Can I Use. So um, that should be your main um, source to see. You should look there and then use Modernizer in your actual browser. I don't actually use Modernizer, though I should probably, because I'm only putting in one or two features. And I prefer to use vanilla JS so that I stay on top of things. Otherwise, my dementia kicks in really fast. Um, so can I use, and then once you're using can I use, on the bottom it says resources, and it will say quirks, you know, things like, it'll give you three or four resources. And then you can also hit the MDN page, which is the Microsoft Developer Network. And there it won't, it doesn't give you as good of a display as to which browsers support it, but it does give you the quirks, um, and it has, you know, basically it said these are the three things wrong with it. And that might not give you the final answer, but at least you know what to look for, because you know what the general quirk is, but you don't know what the solution is, then you know what to Google for. So can I use MDN and then Google? So that's Mozilla Developer Network. Um, oh, sorry, what did I say? You said Microsoft. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, what about Opera? Just wanted to correct I, I, Estelle. I was going to say, I was just going to add to Estelle's answer. She had a great answer. Um, can I use is awesome. The source is also on GitHub, so if you run into these issues, you can contribute back notes. Um, uh, Similar to the MDN, there's a website called webplatform.org, which is an initiative by the W3C to kind of combine all these documentation efforts. Um, Mozilla's donated the MDN, Opera's donated Dev Opera content, Microsoft's donated MSDN content, Google HTML5 Rock stuff. So it's, it's very much a work in progress, and you can, you can go there, you can contribute, but uh, hopefully soon that will be the place to look for stuff like this. Um, and this, maybe not for the faint of heart, but I find the best place to learn about quirks and bugs is reading through source code of uh, libraries, right? Look at, look at Sencha's stuff if you're interested in WebKit implementation quirks. You know, look at jQuery Mobile or Dojo's stuff if you want to know, like, why is this not working? They'll have crazy workarounds and curse words and comments and stuff like that. There's a term that's uh, coming up more and more often. It's called uh, the Internet of Things things, which is basically the idea that everything is connected, your chair, your dog, everything. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this with respect to the fact that if I lose my mobile phone, I've basically lost my identity. So as this becomes more and more progressively the case where you're identifying your device with the object, what are we going to do when everything is connected? and we have problems. Um, so I think it's your identity and so much it's like your ID and we lose our IDs and you know, it sucks for a while, can't get into a bar I guess. Um, but I, I, and there's there definitely certain problems that have to be addressed because there's, you, if, if that is a single point of failure you'll need some sort of way to authenticate via a browser or via another friend's phone or something like that. But uh, a lot of devices nowadays when you, do, when you get a new phone it's, you know, you you associate it with, the, with your previous account and all of a sudden it's like the old phone, uh, except with whatever new features or new hardware, right? Um, so I don't know if that answers that question, but we're definitely getting to Internet of Things. There was, a, there was a really cool commercial the other day about a guy in a plane starting his car heater and I was like, what? Yeah. Well, I think it is really scary because uh, part of uh, from a grad school, part of my, uh, one of my papers had to write was about like the future thinking of databases and how we're all like, all our information is in a database. And that's okay for me, but then what if the government has a database and they input things wrong? It's easy to get things into a database. It's hard to get them to modify it, to correct it. And case in point, uh, uh, my, uh, a very important a IRS uh, or a payroll company inserted my age as being 88. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I was getting retirement papers. And I was like, really? Wow, it's crazy, right? So uh, it took them a while to actually fix that and we weed we, we out. But then all of a sudden, they sold my name. And I also got subscribe, subscription stuff for AARP to everything like that. So it was really like, 
man, man, these people have some great deals. I'm like, sign up for them, man. Uh, so yeah. So that's just like kind of a, a fun story, right? But the, the wrong story would be like if there's something really bad happens, right? If, I, if they somehow the database gets messed up, uh, information gets stolen and stuff like that, or misappropriated, or the government sells information that you didn't know about, stuff like that. Uh, and you know, there's, it, it, it is an issue, and I feel like uh, we as society, society are dealing with that. This is like our first step in dealing with this type of, of issue. And you can see that as issues when we have to go f deal with Congress about SOPA, about some other issues too like that. And I'm really, really looking forward to the day when we hire congressmen and presidents who have been online for most of their lives. And then that's, good. that's one thing that's gonna be really awesome uh, for everyone involved. So, right. And there'll be cats everywhere. All right, Joe. Cat yeah. GIFs. I love that we're passing this mic, by the way. Um, so I, I probably have the complete opposite response to the gentleman at the end have. I actually think, uh, I actually am all about it. Um, I don't think there's anything, sir. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I, I, I think the big, the big, bigger concern I have is the attachment of fear of something like this. Like, we're all gonna have these connected devices and therefore it's scary. But it's pretty scary today for a lot of things. So for example, if your credit score is inputted improperly, that can really screw up your life, right? It's not stopping anybody from getting a loan. It's not stopping anybody from using their credit card. Um, we use paper for medical records right now. Massive amount of error in that sort of thing, right? And then think about if you can start to optimize things like your energy usage in your home because all of these things are actually wired together. I actually think if we get past the concept that, you're a, that there's something scary because all of these things are connected, we'll actually start to see the, the true value uh, and, and how it could actually start to really revolutionize not only developed economies, but places that are, um, that are struggling or that are, are developing. I think there's a huge opportunity to, to leverage the power of connected devices through data to empower um, up and coming areas. Day, but it brought up an interesting point that I didn't hear too much about until then about the low end of the mobile world and the tablet world. Whereas um, most of us, we tend to have you know, a fairly recent device, a year or two old, and we're happy to trade in because that's what we do. We work with technology and we like using new stuff. But it was talking about the people who, you know, average teenager who just wants a smartphone so they can talk with their friends. And they go to the store and they get the $0 device that's running Android 2.1 or 2.2 now. It'll never be upgraded and the carrier's never gonna support something new on it. And previously, with mobile devices, we saw a pretty good uptake in new features because the devices themselves are being released and refreshed fairly quickly. But now we've got this stock of older devices that's in the market and it remains to be seen whether you know, people are actually going to be able to upgrade easily because of the ar kind of arms race between the phone carriers or if they're gonna stick around perpetual and there's gonna be a large chunk of people who have devices that just can't upgrade. I'd just like to hear some of your opinions. Do you think that that's going to be a problem that'll reduce the uptake and or reduce the speed with which new features are adopted on mobile devices? Or do you think that that won't actually be a problem? Um, so uh, I, th I think that's, that's certainly reality today. You know, if, if, you, if you're of the mindset that your universe uh, exists such that everyone has an iPhone or everyone has an Android 4 device um, and you're developing applications and content specifically for those, you're kind of, uh, I guess, screwing over uh, developing markets is, is the nice way to put it. For example, I mean, this is what the, the Firefox OS guys are trying to do, right? They're trying to, they're trying to get a feature phone uh, category experience or device with a smartphone experience, rather. Right, they're they're launching in Brazil because feature phones are huge there. Um, I mean, Opera, kind of our bread and butter is is Opera Mini. Um, certain markets like Nigeria, for example, it's like 90% market share of the internet is feature phones that are Java running Opera Mini. Like those guys will never be able to upgrade, or, or it'll take some time, right? Um, whether or not that'll that'll impede the ability to to adopt certain features. Probably, but you really have to kind of take everything um, in stride, right? Look at the context of the work that you're doing. Uh, if you're developing web applications for X, Y, and Z, you know, um, maybe you don't need to worry about feature phones, but for general web content stuff, I would 
would argue yes. Um, I don't know if I actually answered your question. <laughs> uh, but you nodded a few times, so. Um, I think it also, I mean, everyone here probably does websites, or maybe you just like to go to conferences because you like to meet people who do websites. I don't know. But um, <laughs> your, your website does different things. Some people are doing web applications. Some people are doing brochure websites. And some people are doing stores, let's say. And like when I did a website back in 2005, I did a website for, it was called Pick a Movie, and you would order your pizza and a movie online. And the only way to pay was PayPal. And what I told the client was, that's OK, because if someone in 2005 is going to be ordering pizza and a movie online in 2005, they likely have a PayPal account. Um, so it, it's, you know, if you're, it depends what you're selling. It depends what you're doing. You do want to make all the information available to everyone. But you don't have to, there's certain things that no one is going to be doing on a feature phone. So you don't need to think about, you know, like there's certain games. Like I don't know if you're going to play Angry Birds on a feature phone. I don't usually, I don't, I've never played Angry Birds. So, but I can't imagine playing Angry Birds on a screen this big that you can't touch. So. It's kind of like, what are you, what are you doing? If you, are, if you are providing information, if you're trying to sell something, if you're trying to sell something and it doesn't work on feature phones, then you're missing all of Africa. Um, so, you know, depends what you're doing. Sorry. Yeah. But she's right. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, I think this is, a, this is something we've been dealing with web app, website, web application development for years is that is there a business case to actually end up supporting these lower end devices or, I mean, if you, if you look at, you know, log data for all the types of devices that are say hitting your web servers or something and it turns out that one tenth of one percent are running Android 2.2 or below, it's a hard sell I would think to get someone to say, oh, we absolutely need to be supporting that, right? And um, I think particularly in developed areas like the United States, um, at Bizarre Voice, we have a, a handful of, uh, a number of uh, Fortune 500 clients, and when we talk to them about what are, what are the, uh, the devices that are actually hitting your guys' sites, it's either 90% iOS or it's 80% Android, depending on, on the person, and in addition to that, they're, fortunately, they're actually the more progressive levels of Android. So, I mean, there's no real silver bullet, I think. At the end of the day, you have to actually make a, a business case, I think, to still support it, just like a lot of people still have to support IE6 because it's so big in China. That's a, if that's a market that you have to hit, then that's a thing you gotta support, right? If people are using feature phones or Android 1.6 devices, and that's a huge you know, chunk of, of the, your users, I guess you gotta support them. William, do you have a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I just have a quick question because we're talking about mobile devices. Um, how do you resolve, and there are a lot of tensions between browser um, manufacturers and, and people who generate the, uh, you know, the, the recommendations from W3C and these sorts of things, and we see all these things. How do you resolve tensions between um, these groups and perhaps the, uh, the carriers, Verizons and the AT&Ts of the world, and do you see any reason why we should be concerned about their involvement and role in mobile development? They're holding us back. They are. I mean, they're, they're limiting our bandwidth. They're limiting the speed as to how fast we can download stuff. They're uh, limiting how much we can access a month. Uh, they're making you pay $26 a month for like three gigs. It's ridiculous. We are so backwards when it comes to other countries in certain respects. And in other respects, we've made the rest of the world backwards compared to us because of uh, the Digital Millennium Act. Um, half of the world can't download movies because of legislation that is caused by Hollywood lobby in the United States government making treaties with other governments. So they're uh, part of the problem. And uh, if, they're, if, they wanna be, if they're pretending to be part of the solution, my thought is, I've never worked with them, but my thought is, that they're only going to do stuff that is in their best interest to make them a buck. And I think all of us believe in open web standards and making everything as open as possible, which is the antith, antith, antith whatever, of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I had an opinion on that, sorry. Good. <laughs> The only, I think it's, it's, this is gonna answer it kind of, I guess, but. Um, There's no good answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, because uh, she put it very, very plainly, like, look, the reality is these are for-profit corporations that have interest in providing profit to their shareholders. That's, that's what a corporation does. Um, but in addition to that, I think that their, their interest and or meddling in the space is, is quite interesting, because you look at something like SMS revenues, they're going down dramatically year over year. Telephony minutes on your phone. I, 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 prob I don't speak on my phone hardly anymore, right? I, and there's the over-the-top messaging things like WhatsApp and Voxer and Kick and these sorts of things. So the mobile network operators are struggling at this point to find new revenue sources. And it's in their best interest, if they can, to try to affect things in a way that will you know, lighten the, the, the blow, so to speak, and meddling in working bodies or standards bodies or whatever, it's probably not a bad move from them from a corporate perspective. Uh, I think the, the delta is, is that you have to have organizations like Mozilla that are willing to consistently disrupt the sort of the corporate machine, if you will, that's gonna impact how web development standards and, and the open web actually persists. Uh, you saw this happen with Firefox launching as a browser. You're seeing this sort of thing happen with Firefox OS in emerging markets where they're gonna be launching in Brazil. Um, the mobile network operators down there aren't gonna really have a choice when the open web is actually what ends up ruling the land down there, in my opinion. I had a slide in my presentation today that I, had, it was a picture that I'd taken of Kroger and it was the end aisle where they were selling pay-as-you-go phones and they were all Android phones and one of them was an Android 2.2 phone. And it just blows my mind that you can even buy that today. But obviously there's a lot of money and it's not just from the carriers but from the vendors as well for them to make these cheap phones just to get one into your hands so that they can sell you minutes so that they can turn a profit. I mean, so it, I mean, it really is about money and that makes sense. That's how the economy works. But at the same time, I mean, there's, there's kind of a, a mindset shift that we need to have Culturally, I think, for us, devices are very personal, right? Like, I have an iPhone, so I'm better than you because you have an Android phone, or, you know, whatever, whatever your, your thing is. Um, I don't think you can take an Android phone into Starbucks. I don't know if that's legal or not. Can you do that? I don't think, I don't think you can. My point is, in telling you this, is that I think that devices will become more and more personal, and they already are, and people will not want to buy the pay-as-you-go phone off the end of the rack because nobody wants to be a pay-as-you-go phone, right? And so everybody's going to have their device. That is your device. This is me. Um, we're moving in that direction, but we're not quite there yet. And when we get there, then the networks and the vendors will have lost a lot of the power that they have now in just kind of selling junk. I mean, you can, I think... I haven't walked into a telephone store where they, like an AT&T or Verizon shop in six years. Um, because I, I uh, well, you don't need to know what types of phone I buy, but um, <laughs> my assumption is that when you are in the store, they are trying to market you certain phones, and it's based on how much money they're going to make off your phone. And so my assumption is that they're not marketing the Windows phone because Windows owns Skype. And at some point, they're going to put Skype on the phone, and then no one is going to be paying for minutes anymore, um, or even for SMS messages. WebRTC, same thing. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Nathan? I saw somebody had taken a similar, is this on? Yeah. I saw someone had taken a similar picture. It's like Android 2.2, you know, it's 2013, they're still selling these. It's like, Android 2.2 must be the OS choice of drug dealers because only burner phones have it, right? <laughs> um, but like you're saying, like you know, so. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I have a 2.1, just so you know. Uh, oh, so at search home, your home. In a drawer. Um, but it, it's boggling to me that if Android's free, right? So why would you choose an out, outdated version of a thing that is free? And I, I don't know. Like I guess I pose that question to you guys. What do you think it is that these burner phones or the you know the the high margin phones that are not great hardware running the, the outdated OS, is it because the hardware requirements for 4.0 is higher or that's perplexing to me? The easiest answer to that question is cost is a major factor in purchasing a phone and free is a pretty awesome price, right? Um, second, secondarily to that, most consumers will not go, 
hmm, this is running Android 2.2, therefore I don't want, they're not gonna do that, right? They're gonna say, this is a smartphone and I can access the internet and it's free, yeah. right? They don't, they don't, you know what I mean? So, so and it, I guess my question is like, if you're the manufacturer, is it that you've already got your assembly line and kind of manufacturing process tooled to the, the phones that can only run 2.2 because of hardware requirements? Cheaper hardware. Yeah, it's, okay. it, yeah, so there's, there's cheaper hardware, there's the, oh, the licensing itself, and then right there's inventory, supply and demand. So if you've got a ton of craptastic Android devices left over, you may be able to cut a deal with Cricket that says, hey, give these away for free and we'll only charge you guys X amount of dollars and that loosens, right, that, that loosens up our inventories. Yeah, and then they make it up on subscription. Correct. There was, there's actually, phones are, the basic phone is so cheap to make that there was actually a magazine that had an ad in the centerfold part of the magazine that had a phone inside and it was just the motherboard and it only could dial one number. But they actually did this whole video online where they took it apart and dialed a number off of it. So that's how cheap a phone can be and it had a little battery just long enough so that they could post the message. Wow. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was, but someone could probably Google it. Travis? So any conversation about mobile and the future, uh, especially in the states, should probably include spectrum discussions. Um, there's rumors that we're gonna be running out of it, uh, at least what's regulated right now, uh, sometime in the next year. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about that and, and whether or not you actually think it's as big of a deal as, as some people are making it out to be? Um, and how is that gonna affect us as developers? I swear I'm not supposed to answer every question, but you guys are, you're like baiting me. So um, I am not a, a, an expert in, in Spectrum. What I do know is that um, years ago, Google, I think already saw a lot of this coming. So they, they bought a company called Grand Central, which is also now known as Google Voice. They bought a company called Gizmo5, which does uh, SIP-based messaging, which is effectively, um, it's similar to VoIP, but it's over a data network. Uh, and then in addition to that, you know, Google's got the, the Google Fiber in Kansas City, and I think they're open up in other markets. So I think the, the shift to, to resolve that is actually figuring out the best way to manage data channels uh, and, and data access, and whether it's you know, massive Wi-Fi networks, whether it's uh, you know, just what we currently have for, for LTE and 4G. Um, ultimately, if we can get off of the concept of spectrum for telephony, uh, and just shift directly to data, I think that, that that may potentially resolve that issue, and you're starting to see Google try to actually go down that route. They actually were trying to lease uh, Spectrum from the FCC years ago, and then pulled out of it for whatever reason, potentially maybe too many political issues or whatever, but they were actually trying to go that route and determine that it wasn't the route for them. So in my opinion, there's gotta be something along uh, just resolving it through data 100%, and that's probably the best, best solution. Yeah, I had a question on who do you think is going to be the driving factor going forward on standards compliance? Um, right now, we have, you know, HTML5 working group, but they take four years to come out with something. And then we see all these mobile devices hitting the market, really fragmenting, so there's not really a market driver anymore. I mean, I'm seeing not even, my website has less than 75% Microsoft hitting it, you know? And out of that remaining 25%, it is very fragmented, it's all over the map. And I can only see it going more and more to that. So there won't be this market driver saying this is the way it's going to be. And then the standards bodies take forever to get around to it. And I really don't want to support 20 different browser prefixes. Because now my you know, mobile device has four different browsers or five different browsers and everything else. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Who's going to be driving uh, standards and making them happen? Um, you guys are. Seriously. Uh, SAS and Compass was developed, and now they're putting variables and mix-ins and calculations in CSS. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so with tools like Prefix Free and Compass, uh, all your prefixes are, are, can be put in on the fly or automatically, so you don't have to worry about uh, making sure all these prefixes are, are in there and it'll be delivered to the browser that you want it to be. As for uh, people who are driving the browsers right now, I feel it's like actually 
uh, you know, I, like Google is just driving it home real fast. Firefox is, you know, Mozilla is doing a great job, and the browsers are doing a great job, a lot more than they were in the, uh, you know, five, seven years ago. You know, they're really pushing hard to put, and put these browsers out there. So, and, you know, we have to, and there's still going to be some fragmentation. Like, you know, that, that's the response to web design. You know, that's like you have to make sure your website is flexible enough to, to meet these, uh, these ever-changing devices as they come up to it. And that's just the challenge and the coolness of being a um, web and mobile designer. So, to me, so. Oh, did I say something wrong? No, no. I mean, I, I basically Prefix Free is handling the problem that we have now. But there are channels on IRC, and there are the um, Chrome developers and the Mozilla developers and the Opera, well, less so the Opera developers, but Opera has a system of hearing, not necessarily through the developers, but through their uh, web openers. Um, and they listen to us, and they're, they're also developers, so they have the same issues as we do. And they're very responsive. If you, you know, we were at a talk at CSS DevConf in Hawaii, because Chris is awesome and he organized it. Um, and uh, there was someone who did a presentation on animation, and she had an issue, and Tab Atkins was sitting in the audience, and he's like, okay, let's put that into the spec, you know, right there. So you, we actually, it, Tab Atkins oh, is on the WC3 in the um, CSS working group, and he works at Chrome, um, for Chrome at Google. So that is the type of communication that's actually happening. When I had an, you know, an issue the other day, um, I was going to ask David Barron, who is the developer at Mozilla. And he's right there in the chat room, and you can ask him. And then I realized that all my examples were WebKit prefixed, and I had to change the prefix to Moz before asking him. So I didn't actually ask him uh, yesterday, but I'm planning on asking him my question uh, tomorrow after I change my prefixes. Um, I guess. What I'm hearing, you know, who's going to drive, uh, what was the word, progress? Standards. Standards, Standards. thanks. Yeah. It's, it's really everyone, right? <laughs> so, so if you look at all the various different browsers that maybe when you hear developers, they talk about fragmentation and they talk about pain and I, I get that and it's painful and I develop for a living as well. But if, if you kind of take a step back and look what the result is of that, um, ultimately, it pushes the web platform forward, right? You have, for example, Apple came out with touch events on their iPhones and other browsers um, backported that, right? And then they're terrified of patents, and Microsoft says, you know what, let's, let's have a better model. Let's do pointer events, and we'll be able to unify different devices and touch. And um, I think that's a really good idea, um, and I think other browsers will pick that up. So instead of just taking, say, okay, iPhones are great, let's just do whatever Apple wants. You have another company saying, let's try another idea, right? And unfortunately, the standardization process, it takes time, right? You have to go back and forth, and you have to kind of think through ideas and, and argue, and you have to have implementations. And um, it sucks as a developer, but um, you get paid to suffer. So, right, there's worse problems to have. Um, and ultimately, technology progresses this way. Um, web, web standards is really the answer, right? You have fragmentation, but as long as you're, if you're dedicated to sticking to the standard, um, the major browsers will eventually get there to some degree, right? There's always bugs and it always sucks, but. That was also pretty much exactly what I was going to say. Uh, developing is hard. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to get easy again. There was a, there was a short time when nobody had uh, feature phones, nobody had smartphones, and everyone had IE6, right? That's never going to happen again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there is a lot of, inter like, there is a lot of interoperability. Well, there's a lot of working together, I think. Uh, so specifically with the pointer events, you know, Microsoft said, hey, we're going to do this roll-up uh, pointer event. Uh, and this, that, that was submitted to uh, the W3C as, as a spec, as a draft spec. And then they uh, uh, developed a patch for WebKit and submitted that. Said, hey, here, here, here's the implementation in WebKit as well. So I don't know if that would have ever happened you know, back in the day. Uh, the standards process is still contentious. It takes time. But there is movement forward, even though they're bickering all the way. Um, and there's going to be other stuff that's going to continue to come out of 
individual device manufacturers and, 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 and you know, things like that that have to work their way back into standards process. I don't think that gets any easier, but fortunately these are like 10, 14 year processes. Right. <laughs> so all right, we're going to have time for one more question. So Ray, go ahead. What are some of the new web dev tools features that are going to help alleviate some of this difficulty of development? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one thing that comes to mind to alleviate this pain, right? I mean, right now you have you have some really good developer tools out there. Like, uh, I think all browsers have decent developer tools. Um, I, I have favorites, um, but you see kind of a lot of cross pollination, right? This week, um, someone figured out how to hook up the the Chrome Dev Tools to Firefox OS devices. Right, because they don't have decent remote debugging. Um, that's crazy, um, but people are saying, okay, let's just speak um, that protocol and let's implement it in our devices. Um, so that type of thing, I think, is possible. Um, another, another tool that came out this week, which I think is really cool, is this, uh, what is it, modern.ie, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Microsoft says, we really want you to support our browsers, um, so we're going to make it really easy. Put in a URL and it's going to go scan and say, oh, you, you left out this prefix, or hey, we've got these Windows 8 tiles. If you're into that, you can add this meta image thing. Um, that kind of stuff is super helpful. Instead of kind of just complaining and shaming, it's saying, here's a tool, here's some suggestions. Um, yeah, shaming's fun, right? Like I get paid to complain on Twitter and stuff like that. but. Um, it's, it's nice to be helpful as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that one of the things that's, that's definitely going to help is uh, you know, pushing the phone manufacturers, uh, so wh whomever is flashing the OS on there, to make sure that the latest browser is, is actually on there. Um, so that the, uh, what, even, even if you have to remote test and you, you still need to view what the site looks like, you know that the code you're writing is targeted toward a, a rendering engine that's going to uh, behave predictably, I guess, as predictable as it would in the desktop version, right? So, uh, and that may be, so with uh, Android, whenever they moved to Chrome with their, as their default browser, that was huge, right? So you're, you don't have millions of people who don't even know that they can install Chrome using the default uh, Android browser. I don't remember what the default Android browser was called. Android browser, Android yeah, which browser. was, which was yeah. terrible. Um, which was just terrible browser. So the fact that a, the, a, a good browser was included as default was big. The fact that with the latest Windows phones that uh, IE10 is included is a big thing, right? Because it's like a capable browser. So I think that will be big. Um, and that kind of makes it a little easier. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't solve the tooling issue, but it makes the predictability a little bit easier. Um, I'm a designer front-end guy, so what I'm about to say probably is foreign to, my, to me a little bit. But, uh, but I just uh, picked up uh, Divya's uh, HTML5 boilerplate book. And uh, she goes into saying, like, well, there's so much stuff in boilerplate, it's amazing. But part of the stuff that's in there that, I, as a front-end person, I don't, I don't really know about, but is all these hooks that you can actually automate the testing process uh, when you have your site built and you, know, you have your command line tools to actually say, okay, I'm done, let's deploy this site. And, and actually, I'll actually go through a whole bunch of series of JS checks and, um, and stuff like that, and CSS checks and all this stuff like that. So I think that's just that kind of automation, if, you're, if you have a good uh, developer on your, on your team or you want to learn that stuff, will help speed things up a lot. Um, and, and also, like, in terms of, you know, I just wrapped up designing web and mobile graphics, and I spent a lot more time getting familiar with Illustrator and, and Photoshop uh, and stuff like that. There's just a really lot of great things that they put into these tools that we've had forever to really speed up uh, making web graphics. I mean, just m making SVG graphics and having them actually show up in the browser and not like, a big question mark icon is totally amazing to me, but, um, but I get impressed easily. But uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, the tools are there, we just have to, you know, like, and, like you're asking for, for where they are, so, but, but yeah. And, and virtualized tools are available, they're not perfect, but you know, there are a lot of images out there that you can run, um, so it's not a complete black box. I think the browser developer tools are pretty, like, friggin' amazing um, at this point. Um, I remember when, I think Firebug was the first tool that I actually used where I could actually see what was going on in the background. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, 
I can actually like build something. This is great. And now we've gotten to the point where like we have like source maps and things like that, and we can take other languages and debug them at runtime, and we can you know profile and look at memory. I mean, we have tools for the web that I don't think a lot of like you know native developers have. And so there's, but one, one place where we haven't really kind of cracked that nut all the way is mobile. That's still kind of a black box and can be very difficult. But I think, um, so there's, Adobe's got Edge Inspect. Um, Estelle was telling me, yeah, I'll let her tell about the, some BlackBerry stuff. But there's, I think we're going to see more tooling in that area where we can have the same, like, debug experience on mobile that we have on the desktop browser. And that's really going to change things. Um, so the mobile devices, you, there's basically a debugger for most of them. There's a winery, just as a general um, uh, generic one. But the BlackBerry 10 uh, debugger is awesome. I mean, it really is an awesome browser, and it has an awesome debugger. And this is coming from someone who tweeted when I went to the BlackBerry conference. I said, whoever um, said that no one has a BlackBerry is wrong. At least 20% of the people here do. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. But it's actually it's actually a kick-ass browser and a great debugger. There's um, Edge Inspect. There's also the Chrome uh, mobile. If you're tethered, you can debug. Um, and then there's another thing, which is everyone here has the Chrome debugger, uh, Chrome on their desktop, right? On their laptop. They're all asleep. I didn't see. I saw one hand. Okay, good. Um, I showed it in my talk today, but there's, I mean, it's just so much deeper than that. So there is a talk online that you should all watch. It's called like Secrets of Chrome or something, and it goes into the debugger. Because one thing we haven't talked about here on mobile, we've talked a lot about like what the capacity is. We haven't talked about what the limitations are, um, except for in terms of like, you know, what can't we code? One of the big limitations is memory on your device. Um, the iPhone, my first iPhone was 128 megs of RAM. You know, I'm developing on an 8 gig computer for 128 megs of RAM. Um, as developers, it is our job to manage memory for the user because it's 128 meg megs of RAM, but that's running the OS plus all the apps that are open, plus the browser, then your web app inside of that. So open up. Develop in Chrome, or and I'm, there's, there might be other browser um, inspector uh, debuggers that have this, but it actually shows how much memory that one tab is using and what is using um, that. And it also has like a CSS. You can see how long it's taking for your select the browser to parse your selectors. You know, figure out what selectors you are taking forever. It's only 1.3 seconds. I mean milliseconds, which isn't a lot of time, but when you account all these things that we're throwing into these, because we're basically developing these kick-ass applications because we can for a browser that has these awesome, uh, for uh, devices that have awesome browsers, but no memory um, and no battery life. So um, be aware of that and use the tools. And tools are definitely out there. They're right there in your browser. So I would like to talk about two things really quickly that are slightly higher level than a drill down actual specific type of tool. So Netflix is a company that's done a phenomenal job with scaling uh, their, their platform across loads of devices. And they do um, run an HTML5 stack for all that, which is really impressive as well. Um, and they, had a, they have a really good blog post. You can find it on their engineering blog about um, there's you know 3,700 plus Android devices, and God knows how many different flavors of Android and different ROMs, et cetera. Uh, and they realize that it just simply doesn't scale to try to get every single one of these devices. So what they've done is they take something like Android and they, they bucket them into specific categories, and they have sort of these baseline smoke tests that they run against those, and if those pass, then they have a reasonable level of confidence that across all of the devices in said category will actually actually work. So that sort of leads me to my second point is um, the number of devices that we have to test against or we should be responsibly testing against is huge. Uh, and in addition to that, particularly to the, to the question earlier about older devices, older versions of Android and et cetera, um, there's actually, I think, a movement taking place. I, I want to say it's in Oakland or San Francisco where it's a community device, uh, I don't know, like, 
I don't know what they call it, but you, you can go to this lab effectively and donate your devices, your old devices, and test stuff against all of these devices. Uh, I think it's in Oakland. Um, I'd love to see that sort of stuff happen in Austin, and particularly in places like um, in emerging markets and whatnot, where they can actually, where they may not even have access to a number of devices. They can actually have them in a, in a community aspect so that they can actually see um, and test against those. So, I think on that, I think that's a great way to wrap up. So thank you all. Thank the panelists again. Really appreciate it. Thank you all.